So welcome to Will, and thanks for making the time tonight on Absolutely. election night to come out. Hey, everyone. Sorry that I was a little late. Um, so now that I've been uh, promised stories, I guess I need to tell one, which has nothing to do with data, but has everything to do with opposition research, which is the most lurid thing I've ever found on a client. Uh, that would be in my uh, home state of Louisiana, where I was working for a state senator. And it turned out that I found a news clip of him who, being pulled over for drunk driving, for uh, speeding, going about 80 miles an hour the wrong way up a divided highway at 4 a.m. And um, the charge had been expunged. And uh, so I brought this back to him and said, okay, I found this. And he dropped out the next week. And so I said, okay, I talked to him media consultant said, well, why'd he drop out? He had to have known I would find this. And he said, well, you wanted to know if you found it after you had the charge expunged. And I said, well, it's drunk driving. That's no big deal. It's Louisiana. And he said, no, you don't get it. So he's married, and it's not the fact he was driving drunk or the fact he was driving up the wrong way up a divided highway at 2 a.m. It's the fact that there was a prostitute in his lap while it was happening, and he didn't want that to come out and hit the news. So that's... Uh, Example of what you might call quant qualitative, not quantitative research. It has very little to do with data in any way and just has a lot of embarrassing nonsense about people who then pay me money to find it. Um, anyway, so opposition research is, uh, everyone thinks it's a dark art. Uh, I don't really mind people calling it dark, but I do kind of bristle at it being called an art. I try to make it as replicable as possible and just as, as science-y as I can get. Ideally, any poll, you know, every campaign has the same data. You know, I, I do my research and uh, the other side does their research. We test the exact same stuff. We find the ideal things to say. We go out and then we, the best person wins. Of course, that um, is not at all how it happens. And on, honestly, the pro one of the biggest problems I wind up having is trying to anticipate what attacks are going to happen on my client when they have, frankly, incompetent opposition researchers. But that's just my problem. Um, Illinois is actually a very interesting case study here in that I don't know how many of you have ever tried to find out Illinois' legislative data, but it's the single worst state I've ever worked in, including state where states where the legislature isn't even online and you just have to go to the library and find the written journals, even then it's terrible. Um, there's a, a few reasons for this. One, until very recently, it was, a, it was almost impossible to even scrape uh, votes electronically uh, just because they had PDFs with characters in different positions. Of course, the Open State Project has gotten around that, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, amendments that uh, are voted down, they're just not recorded. Uh, sometimes they're recorded, but generally speaking, unless it's approved, it just goes down into the ether and you can't find it. I mean, these, <laughs> these are big deals. These are like ver versions of budgets and um, major legislation, and it just uh, goes down the memory hole. The other, uh, and uh, the final thing is the heavy reliance on shell bills, which uh, usually you have a legislature, they have a bill, and it more or less stays the same. It does, I don't know, commemor commemorates puppies, it passes the House, it goes to the Senate, they amend it, they send it back. Illinois, both chambers will just approve a bunch of blank bills and send it over, and then send it over to the other chamber. Then the other chamber will, at the last minute, dump, say, the entire state budget into this random postal commemoration bill and then send it back. The reason why is very complicated, but the upshot is it makes it very hard to track legislation. Probably by design, I don't actually have an opinion on the current House Speaker and State Party Chairman Mike Madigan, who is as we speak, winding up a primary against him. But he certainly has not made my job easy. Um, but that is changing. Um, and I was actually talking about this with Derek Eater. Uh, and we're going back and forth, and I said, well, it's really hard to scrape uh, Illinois' legislative data. And he says, what are you talking about? We scrape it every day. Uh, and I looked at it, and I said, OK, so here's the thing. This is, all, this is data that's available to everyone, but it's not exactly useful. And this is kind of a... Uh, recurring theme for open government people. I mean, you can have all of the data in the world, but it doesn't really mean anything to real people or people who you know, would use it. In fact, ironically, opposition researchers are probably the best force you have for open government because we want to expose our opponents, and so we have the biggest incentive to, uh, to find, find things and put them before the public in terms of votes, tying to campaign finances, tying to actions, and 
property, in, in one case, the client I'm looking at right now. So um, that's a bunch of garbage. Uh, so <laughs> uh, when I'm researching someone, I'm basically trying to separate a target from the voters. I mean, every incumbent wants you to basically believe I'm 100% simpatico with my voters. I vote for everything they want. I vote against everything they don't like. Well, I come along and I'm trying to take him out and I try to take his record and say, no, voters are right here, you're over here. There's really nothing good or bad about it. It's value neutral. I'm just looking at the voting population and looking at a, looking at a record and say, well, okay, this looks like this population probably doesn't agree with this. My, another population might agree with it. I don't really care. It just depends on the circumstance. In the old days, opposition researchers used to use what's called a vote template. Uh, just basically a list of key votes. Uh, saved a lot of time. I mean, there's between 600 and 1,000 roll calls in the U.S. Congress per year. So of those, maybe 100 per year are relevant. Usually it's more like 50. Uh, so you just keep, you know, keep the vote template, you plug in all the votes. That works pretty well for a Republican-Democrat situation in a general election. It is completely useless in a primary. And since we work in a fairly polarized world now, where most of the relevant races are primaries, that puts people like me in a, in a quandary. Well, how do you distinguish good votes from bad votes here when 98% of the time these, two, these you know, two candidates agree on all the issues? Well, in 2012, I was in a super PAC that was exclusively primary people, and it occurred to me, well, why don't I just take two incumbents of similar geopolitical districts and compare them to each other and see where they disagreed. And that was really amazing. I found a bunch of, and, and I found a bunch of votes for incumbents in Texas. We actually beat one of them and uh, another one in um, Ohio and another one in Pennsylvania. And these weren't on traditional left, right, you know, pro-anti-tax, pro-anti-social issues. It's just like, what do, well, what do people in a given population like uh, this one, the 7th District of Illinois, uh, what do people right here care about? Well, the 7th District of Illinois is actually majority African American. Uh, it has the Chicago Loop, but actually most of it's the west side of Chicago. So economic equality probably comes into play, gun control, civil rights issues, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's, so you want to test like where, how, and Danny Davis uh, was one of the people I used here actually because I was looking at an African American incumbent. So I looked at Danny Davis's votes and I forget who I was looking at, but I looked at the other person's votes and just like plugged in where they disagreed. And I found a couple of bad votes on like bankruptcy reform, which bankruptcy reform tends to affect racial minorities and lower income people a lot more. So if a person is representing a majority African American district and votes for bankruptcy reform, well, that's not a great issue. Or within bankruptcy reform, for example, there was an amendment to let people keep guns. Well, all of a sudden that's a gun control vote. So, so, uh, so, you know, you can turn this thing on its head. And uh, so that, after that, I kind of thought, like, well, why don't I do this all the time? I mean, what, what, why do we really think, like, Republican, Democrat, left, right? I mean, people are really, like, they don't think in terms of that, especially when it, the persuadable people. If you're a Republican, you're already go, always going to vote for Republicans. If you're a Democrat, you're always going to vote for Democrats. If you're one of the very small minority, let's say, between 5 and 10 percent of the population who uh, will actually change your mind, well, then it takes a lot more nuance. You might have a lot of a wide array of issues that you care about, and it takes a kind of a more nimble approach. The problem is, is especially at the state level, it's almost impossible to do that. It's, uh, the, the two states where I can consistently do it are Ohio and North Carolina. There where you can very easily just pull a whole, like an incumbent's entire history of votes. You can pull another person's votes. Just look at them and just go line by line by line, see where they, where they clash and then you get a pretty easy idea of what, what's going to be important going forward. Illinois, at least so far, you can't do it. Now, the Open State Project has actually made that possible in Illinois, but it's not put together properly. You can see the vote and the roll calls on a particular bill, but if you look at a, legislate, a legislator and you want just a, a list of all their yes, no, present, etc., dumped into a sheet, can't do that yet. But that's... Um, this is just taking Illinois as, as an example of where I'm, where I'm going with that. And this is, this is us to say that opposition researchers are generally lazy. We don't like doing a lot of work. So the more we can uh, bulk process everything, 
the better. I spend most of my time writing Excel scripts to just code contributions automatically so I don't have to worry about it. Because again, I got into this business in maybe 06, and then we'd have to look, back then we'd look at every single contribution and say, well, that's energy, that's you know, manufacturing, that's coal mining, it just, it took forever. It took about 80% of the time, and it was worth about 5% of the project because honestly, no one cares about just taking money from someone. You have to tie it to votes. So in the cross-referencing part, like you took money from this person and then voted that way, that's always going to involve a certain amount of creative thinking. So that, you know, hard, to put the, hard, hard to automate that process. That's where I earn my money as a consultant. I come in and I know what's relevant. Like a uh, client just asked me for this current primary, like why didn't you look at this one thing where a person got sued? And I said, okay, so this lawsuit dragged on for a year. They went back and forth and then it was settled. So if you come out, that you give this to a reporter, a reporter is just as likely to say, okay, you attacked this person for this reason, but it's really nonsense and you're a, you're a big fat liar as it is to be an effective attack. So that it's always going to take a certain amount of um, um, common sense, I guess you'd say. It's, uh, because there's no reason that these things are uh, good or bad attacks. It's just experience. The only reason I know what works and what doesn't in any given race is I've worked on over three, four hundred races in my career. See what works and see what doesn't. But uh, in terms of uh, automating it, so Jesus, I know like at least four or five researchers that would probably throw in on a project that would actually make that available to us. Not just like open, da open data in terms of open states, but that's what we're actually looking for is being able to tie an individual uh, target to a list of votes just very quickly. And what's in them doesn't really matter that much. I mean, we, because it's all about narrowing it down. I mean, anyone can just sit and look up, okay, what was this bill about? I mean, that's, that's easy. That's Googling. But I need a list of what to look up to begin with. And when we're talking about any average incumbent is going to have a record and maybe, maybe 5% of it's going to be useful to someone like me. Maybe. Probably it's more like 2 or 3% to be quite honest. I mean, I mean you, say, you say perfect things in the press 364 days out of the, out of the year, on the 365th day, you stick your foot in your mouth and then you sound like Hillary Clinton talking about AIDS. So that's just... Uh, what can you do? But that's, I, I mean, looking back, being able to look back and catch things like that, that's what I'm trying to do. And to, and to every extent that we can automate that and just grab what we know is going to be a point of um, conflict, I guess, that's really what the, um, what the ongoing struggle is. One of my colleagues is right now selling a, uh, it's kind of a multi-search engine that sells a bunch of things that we look at, just scrapes a bunch of things we look at every day, like um, federal PACER, uh, court reports and uh, SEC, uh, just a bunch of federal, federal agencies, just to see if like anything comes up at any given point. Which if you're looking at, for example, Donald Trump and you're very interested in whether any given regu regulatory body will take action on any one of his thousand LLCs. Literally, the man has a thousand LLCs. <laughs> this guy, this, so this is an example of how you might, how, how the, this sort of automation process could come into play. Like any day, there could be an enforcement action against this. No one, know, no one knows it's there because I mean, the only, the only people who are who even know how many companies the man even owns are in Hillary Clinton's campaign right there, and they're going crazy trying to catalog everything. So. So that's another example of how, we, how, how we, this, is, this is playing out in the real world and how it's going to continue. So these are not really definitive things. It's just what people like me are trying to develop as we go forward. And as I described earlier, it was a fairly uh, ancient and arcane <laughs> process and a lot of just looking at paper disclosures for not a lot of benefit. But these days, it's not. Research used to be more of a finding things. Now it's more of a sorting process. Like everything out, out there is white noise except for one or two things. How do you find that one or two, th that one or two thing? Well, that's when you call, call us, and that's when we come in. So in, in this is, the industry has been sorting for, uh, been readjusting to this for a while because with the rise of Google and all of these search, search processes, you have a bunch of campaigns saying, well, you know, I could just have an intern do that. And then people like me say, well, no, you can't. You don't know what's important and what's not, and you can find a lot of data. You don't know how to sort it down. And then these campaigns laugh at me, and they go on, and they lose. So that's, that's uh, you know, a long, long process of learning the hard way, but everything's pretty much settling down. Um, do I have to talk on 
longer, or should I take questions now? <laughs> uh, all right, let's take some questions for a while. Uh, all right, a lot of questions. All right, let's uh, you. Yeah. Video clips, where, where do people find those key videos clips, say, where someone says the you know, exact opposite of what they can say? So video is, um, all right, so th this gets into the dynamics of like party politics versus consultants. So I'm a consultant, and I don't, I mean, I work from my bed most of the time. <laughs> I, don't have the, I don't have the resources to go out and capture a bunch of things. A lot of the time I'm working for this one state rep, and his challenger is kind of crazy. Uh, and so I just said the other day, like, you might want to send someone in your campaign out to just videotape them at all events. We call them trackers. Now, Smaller campaigns can't afford to do this on every given possible, every possible given opponent. However, larger, it used to be the national parties, but now it's rolled over the super PACs. They do do that. It used to be that the Democratic National Committee would handle that. Now it's a super PAC called American Bridge. Uh, and I actually know a bunch of people are doing that. And it's basically their job just to hire a bunch of kids who, even before candidates announce, like well before John Kasich ever thought about you know, saying publicly he was going to run for president, they had someone, who, a kid, who would just go into an event like this where he was talking and they'd just set up a camera and sit and read a book. And then they have, they have software that transcribes it. They, uh, they have, they, they have, it comes up now with um, several subject, uh, subject tags, and then they have a huge database of this where they, you know, the moment he says something, they, someone's sitting in an office where they just pull up every single speech they have, look right quick, okay, this is a flip-flop, is this veering over, is it, you say, I never said this, and, and the, so this, which is just to say, this takes a lot of effort, this is very resource intensive, not to process it, we, we've managed the processing of it, that's fine, you know, the technology is a wonderful thing, it's gathering that to begin with, and getting it all in one place, that's when it, when it comes into, that's when you need the huge, you know, ongoing infrastructure, and it costs millions of dollars a year to do just because you absolutely need everyone to be in everywhere at all times to make sure you gather this. I mean, a lot of the material never going to see. I mean, like the candidates are going all over, however, 99 can can uh, counties in Iowa. They made speech after speech after speech, and a lot of dumb things were said, but they're not going to say this. <laughs> they're not going to talk about this, and American Bridge isn't going to use it until right when it would do the most damage. So and, and so this is tricky to see because the current Republic, Republican frontrunner gets a ton of br press coverage. But so you tend to think like, well, everyone sees everything he's saying. Well, no, that's not exactly true. And especially since you, all of the Democratic groups who are tracking them are kind of quiet about this. Like obviously they don't want everyone to know, especially the candidate. Like, yeah, we've got eyes on you. We've recorded everything you've said, and we're going to jam it right back down your throat the moment we feel like doing it. So that's, uh, that's kind of how, it, I mean, video is the wave of the future, but the problem is obviously gathering it. That's, uh, well, but your example of the uh, mm. guy driving, uh, mm -hmm. you have a good enough video of that. Or is it the cop that mm. video? Oh, and the, the Louisiana thing? Oh, no, that was a news clip. But the, the, what the state senator in that, question, in that situation was concerned about is that there was a cop out there who would say, oh, and by the way, this was also happening. But that wasn't a video. I mean, God, that happened in like 1983. Was a <laughs> Don't even think they had dash cams back then. Uh, yeah. Um, you talk about how some states have better open data or better mm -hmm. tracking. Do you believe that's had an influence on the, the quality of open data? Has that an influence on who gets elected or how people vote? Not at all. <laughs> it's. Uh, it's funny like that, the, uh, the two legislatures, the, the two states that I mentioned, Ohio and North Carolina, also have some of the most awful legislators in history. Like in North Carolina, they can't even pass, the, pass a budget with a Republican governor because they're too busy passing laws. They get teens to get doctor's notes before they, pe they uh, get tested for STDs. I mean, because they're just crazy. Um, it's all about how you use it, and that's really what goes back to what I was saying. Open data is not, that's useful, it's a powerful tool, but you have to have someone who can use a tool. Like, a hammer just sitting there is not going to do anything. A carpenter picks up a hammer, he can do a, a bunch of wonderful things with it. But like, open data is just going to be that toolbox just sitting there doing nothing. So when researchers and, I mean, obviously media and other people come into play, that's when we actually use it. 
and, uh, and, and ma make that information work for you. Yep. So it sounds like you, you mentioned uh, campaign finance and, and like voting records as mm -hmm. a couple of like great, great things that um, you might want to pull for a true mm -hmm. when doing research. Are mm -hmm. there any other like generally publicly available sources that you use? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Lexis is technically public, but it's not. So researchers start with LexisNexis, which is a massively expensive database of news clips from the beginning of you know, news clips, or in other words, 1986. Um, so that's not really public. But then campaign finances, votes, uh, courts, which are actually almost never online, unless it's Florida. Florida, for some reason, has everything online, and again, is a terrible state full of um, anecdotal crazy people. Um, so uh, usually I have to make at least one trip to a courthouse to just do a run a court search, even if it's, even if I can run the search online, I can't find the file, so you need to travel there. Property records, there's a recorder of deeds, which is basically every time a property is transferred or a mortgage is taken out. The assessor, which values the house, and the treasurer, which um, collects taxes. So if you don't collect it, so if you don't pay your property taxes on time, which means you're fairly rich because you don't have your mortgage in escrow, um, then that's going to show up in the treasurer. You're going to pay interest on it, and then I can say, you didn't pay your property taxes. You're a terrible person. Of course, I mean, no one pays their taxes on time, for God's sake. I mean, that just means you're a regular person, but uh, anyway. And then, as I was alluding to before, there's a lot of federal bodies that collect a bunch of stuff that is not always terribly relevant or appears to be, like... The SEC has all sorts of filings, like private companies have to file some things, public companies have to file others, and it's just um, just, so, just figuring out what you want to look at is, uh, is often part of the process, in which I, I just look at someone and I say, okay, so he has a small business, check the Secretary of the State to make sure his, franchi his uh, corporate franchise is up to speed, uh, check the local uh, tax policies, like in Wisconsin, any citizen of Wisconsin can request someone else's tax returns. Um, that's nuts. I don't know why they do it, but uh, they do it. So I always have someone on standby in Wisconsin to do that. And um, it's a, and that, those, are the ba those are the main things. It's like courts, property, campaign finance, votes, and quotes. I mean, that's your standard backbone of, uh, of research. And beyond that, it's kind of like, it just depends on the venue. Yes? This is uh, from Steve. Mm -hmm. How do you catch ethical problems like a, like a certain billionaire's university? Uh, just look for lawsuits or something more? That is a really good question, and the co there is no one way. Uh, it, the, the easy way is you, you look for lawsuits, right? But, not all, uh, but lawsuits are not, al uh, not always the, the appropriate venue. The EEOC, for example, has a lot of enforcement actions that don't necessarily show up in court, the uh, Equal, Oper Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So that might be a, that might be a, might be a place there. The Better Business Bureau is not. I mean, I know people talk about the, you know the the universities' complaints of the Better Business Bureau. That's not, in my experience, a great place because it's more like kind of reviews on Yelp. Like, well, anyone says anything, what do you can do? It is a source of data. Basically, you have to identify what the oversight body is, whether it be just courts or whether the state has a particular place for the for these sorts of complaints, or like a board of ethics. Sometimes they have that, and, you, and, and, then, and then you move from there. In the case of uh, wh whom we're all talking about, it's definitely, well, like federal courts in a class action because, the, the, again, it's a very controversial figure, and you have just people say this, people say that. And so really what, what the only thing you can go to is like, well, you're being sued, and this, they said this. And when you say you, settled, you, don't, you never settle lawsuits, well, you settle like half of your lawsuits, so you're a liar too. So it's uh, the question of what is ethical and what's not, that's a very, it's kind of a murky question. And depending on state to state or the federal government, it can change in terms of who handles that or who cares about it. I mean, so, some, sometimes the answer is just nothing. Like there's no, there's no oversight body dictating what I do as a consultant, even though as political consultants often have more power over politicians than lobbyists. I mean, lobbyists, they just uh, go in and say, well, you should pass my bill. If you do, great. If you don't, well... Okay, I'll just try you next year. Consultants, when they, they come to people like me and they say, what should I do? And we say, well, you should do this. And like, we don't report to anyone. We don't file any disclosures. We don't, you know, we don't answer to anyone. So that's, uh, 
you know, one of those black holes, <laughs> I guess you might, might say, just uh, uh, transparency holes. But, uh, so sometimes there is no answer. You just can't find it at all. And that's unfortunate, but that's uh, the world we live in. Yes? Uh, many city councils, including uh, Chicago, basically by the time uh, mm -hmm. uh, Hornet gets to the vote, mm -hmm. all the politics are over, and mm -hmm. they're almost all passing to the unanimous mm -hmm. So how would, you, how would you find, like in the city council, how would you find um, political differences among um, among among our city councilors, given that there's almost no variation in voting. Right. So, Chicago, I've written a lot about about how you identify that actually. So there are collaborative bodies and there are um, partisan bodies. And Chicago, partially because they're all Democrats, is collaborative. Now, the the short question is you have to look at the committees and you have to look at who shows up and who says things because it's not even at the committees, it's already, already worked out in advance. But a lot of the times, like who even shows up is, is a big deal. Like you know, who bothered to come in and record their votes and, the, who, and who just like didn't show up. And like a lot of the times someone will try to get a roll call, but they just get shouted over. So it's like the chair says the eyes have it, shut up, go away. That's, well, first of all, it's not a particularly good way to run a city council. It just doesn't, it's not good. Like, no one even knows how the council works most of the time. Half, I guarantee you, at least half of the city council has no idea how the city council runs. So that's not good. <laughs> Obviously not good. It's subpar. Uh, it also takes, but the only way you change that is to have people who want it to change, basically, so, so like, well-funded, a well-funded opposition party, which you have the Progressive Caucus right now, but half the time they can't even agree on what they want to do. And something I kind of want to kick around and write as a column later is like they could actually learn a lot from the Harold Wash, the Council Wars, which I don't know if anyone uh, recognizes that, but that's when it was racially divided and you had uh, Edward Oliak leading white councilmen against an alliance of white liberals, Hispanics, and blacks. And it was really interesting as an opposition party because just because Verdoliak was, was white and fairly racist didn't mean he didn't understand how to wedge African Americans and Hispanics apart. So, and this kind of, this played a little bit in, the, in last year's election where you could see points at which Chewy Garcia took votes that were for Harold Washington but kind of not, not great for the, for the Hispanic caucus at the time or vice versa. So that's... It, it, was, it's, it was a really rich and elaborate history, and it's a great period to study if you want to understand, like, how do you, how do you screw up the council? How do you, make, how do you bring it to, the screaming, to a grinding halt? Which, is that a good thing? Well, kind of not, but it also, it, that's when differences come out, is when people try to stop the council from doing things. So, uh, I think we're going to see more of that, obviously, because, well, as we just saw, the mayor cannot even tax tobacco uh, without significant opposition. But, um, again, you need well-funded people who know what they're doing, and so far we don't have that. Yes? So, how do you compare, like, a constant politician versus, like, somebody that's not a politician? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. Alice Morgan. How, how do you compare a, a uh, politician with a long record and incumbent to someone who's not a politician? Is that so? Um, to me, it's the length of the record. Like um, again, the state rep race I'm looking at. You have this mayor of a small town, uh, real estate investor, so huge list of property transactions, uh, fairly medium record, I'd say. Look at a congressman who's been in for 20, 30 years, huge record. Now, to me, again, it's not really the size, it's not really insider or outsider or consummate politician versus not politician. It's just the amount of data that I'm going to have to look through. And again, research is not, like we, we use a lot of sorting mechanisms to decide what, what sort of person you are in politics. You know, establishment, non-establishment, insider, outsider, Democrat, Republican. Uh, these, are, these, are way, these are ways we used, these are things we tell ourselves basically to make politics easier to understand, but they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily reflect any, any bit of reality. It's just like, well, I don't understand everything that's going on, I'm just going to sort this out. 
When I look at it, it's just, okay, I see you, you're the candidate, how am I going to put you over here when your voters are right here? And that might, that might depend on, well, okay, so you did, you made a real estate transaction while you were in, well, or you, you were on the city council, you made a, you passed a bill that was favorable to this real estate transaction you were making. Like, this one alderman, this isn't breaking any secrets, so this one alderman of the city council buys up a ton of, pro bought up a ton of property along the, what's now the Bloomingdale Trail. He brought it up when it was just a vacant uh, train track. <laughs> And then he recused himself from any proceedings about the Bloomingdale Trail, but obviously he knew everything was going, what was going to happen in advance. So all of a sudden he sells off these properties at a 300, 400% markup now that there's this big giant park and all the, all the yuppies like me want to move there. Okay, well that might be something that people would, would consider. And you could do this whether you're, I mean, you could make this argument whether you're on, a, you were an incumbent or not an incumbent. You're, there's still this, idea well like you got in on something that the rest of us weren't or you did something that just doesn't reflect well doesn't show that you're out for you care about people like me which is just again just one question that you ask like there, there's all of these like shares my values cares about people like me you know continuing Obama's policies to throw in one of the candidates who's up tonight uh, so there's just all of these questions that you, you take that you want, that you're looking at this population, like what are they asking when they're looking at the candidates, and you want to basically say, okay, how do I say this candidate's not that? Yes? How do you determine what the, the uh, population, you know, the voters want? Like is it just instinct, or do you have to kind of way? <laughs> yes, <laughs> basically. Uh, it's, all, it's all a lot of guesswork, but in my case, I like to think that it's informed by a lot of trial and error. Uh, there's a lot of like broad tropes you can say, like if a population is universally white and rural and uh, like blue collar, they probably like gun rights. They probably don't like fa policies that are fairly favorable to urban voters, like food stamps or whatever. Like just just because of the way these these things have sorted out over the years. If you have a have a heavily urban voter again, like the you know the seventh congressional district, like here, probably anti-gun, pro-Obama. You know, don't care that much about taxes at the federal level. Do care about like sales taxes because low income uh, sales taxes affect low income people more, and a couple other things. These are just like, and again, there's no reason this has to be the case. This is, and it's important to remember that. Like a lot of the, a lot of the, um, what, what's been uh, one one question that's been raised in the uh, presidential primaries, like exactly how black voters think. Uh, because it's like Hillary has a lot of black voters and Bernie Sanders has been trying to, trying to appeal to them. So it's like, how do you do that? And he's using this primarily economic message when in reality, like you, just because you're reliably ben Democrat doesn't mean that you're necessarily ultra liberal. It, may, it might mean a few other things. And, and again, the only re way you learn that is the hard way, which is the problem. Like you have to make a lot of mistakes going forward about, like um, Mike Quigley, one of the people I, got, I helped get elected in 2009, uh, campaign manager decided to attack his opponents for supporting the Todd Stroger sales tax. And this was also, this was in the same vote that gave uh, free rides to seniors in the CTA. And I yelled at the campaign manager, I was like, you're an idiot, you're, we're gonna get attacked for, giving for yelling about free rides for seniors. It was devastating to them and we won. I mean, I, I was wrong, I presented the information but I didn't think it was right. But the fact is that people were so angry at Todd Stroger at that point that they were calling, they were calling up uh, Quigley's campaign saying, how, how do I vote against Todd Stroger? You, you're the guy? I vote for you? Uh, okay, great. He wasn't even, he was about for Congress. I mean, what? Okay, well, so again, it's trial and error, and it's not necessarily rational, and you can't think like, okay, well, if this happens, they must think this. You just have to, like, keep, well, okay, in similar situations, what has happened before, and, uh, and go from there. One more question? Yeah. Um, what do you, what's kind of your general opinion on, uh, big question, sorry, on FOIA? Uh, not necessarily in Illinois, but other states as well. Well, FOIA is, first of all, FOIA in federal agencies is a waste of time. It will take literally years to get what you want, even if you're a reporter, and even if you're not a reporter like me, like I just got a FOIA request back a couple months ago that I sent on Mark Kirk seven years ago. I just got it back. I'm like, oh, thanks, I, I guess. All right, fine. Um, it's, 
an interesting tool. Now, the thing to remember about FOIA is, is it's never, people think it's like going to turn up something that's hidden, and it's really not. What it does is it gives you a data set, and that's properly the way to look at it. Like I saw, I was working for one client and I FOIA'd her office and it came back and I was looking at the use of a credit card and I was looking at the transactions and it just, it jumped out at me. I was like, oh, this credit card was lost right here. Like, and there were fraudulent transactions here and it was recovered here and then they were all, so, and so okay, well that's, is that attack? I don't know. Like you lost the government credit card, you're incompetent, I, you know, whatever. You can pull that in any number of ways. The point is that this is not some deep, dark secret. It's an array of data where you just look, okay. Or like travel expenditures, like you do, you, you do this every year, you go to this conference every year, all of a sudden you're in, the, you're in this conference over here. Well, what did you do that for? You know, that's, a, that's an outlier here. So I think people, what people need to understand about that is that it's a, it's a sorting process, that even when you get a FOIA request return, return excuse me, it's going to be a long process and it involves a lot of work and you're probably not going to get something drastically new uh, because the fact is that people just can't hide things. I mean, you just, I mean, I, I, I could go with any three, three of you people and tell a secret and, some, and another five people are going to know about it before the night's out. <laughs> That's just the way it works. I mean, I mean, it is the way it works. But people don't, People can't keep secrets, but they can overlook data. Almost everyone overlooks patterns because we don't know how to look for it. And it's only if you're looking for a very specific question that things can start to pop out at you. So that's, um, that's kind of how I approach FOIAs.